OK, let's look at another example problem. This one states that we have a thin cylindrical rod of thermal conductivity k equals 35 and radius equals 0 0.1. It has a temperature distribution given by t equals 120 minus 0 0.1 times z squared, where the temperature is in degrees Celsius. So then we're asked, at a certain distance, what is the rate of heat transfer through the rod? So this problem, we're given a temperature profile, or a temperature distribution, and we also know the thermal conductivity of our solid. So that is really everything we need to know to be able to calculate flux at any point within this solid. So let's examine this problem a little bit first. So we, we have temperature varying only as a function of z. So z in cylindrical coordinates represents the distance axially, or down the length of our cylinder. So temperature only varies with z. So we'd expect to see temperature varying in this direction. We would not expect to see temperature varying in this direction for this particular problem. This is characteristic of what's called a thin fin or a thin, a thin rod like this. It, there's so little area um, in the radial direction that you see the biggest temperature differences in the z direction and you can neglect what's happening in the r direction. We are also neglecting what is happening in this angular direction of phi. So we're basically assuming that if we took a slice out of this guy at any point, that whole entire slice would be uniform in temperature. But if we took another slice later on, we might expect that slice to be a different temperature. So let's look, let's think about what that temperature profile actually looks like. So we have temperature as a function of z. We see it is decreasing quadratically. So the way that we would calculate flux, we would apply Fourier's law, which tells us that flux is equal to minus k times the gradient of our temperature. But because we know that this is only varying in one dimension, our, that gradient becomes a little bit simpler. And we can look at just our flux in the z direction is just equal to minus k dt dz. And I actually am not using partial derivatives because this particular equation, temperature is only a function of one spatial variable, which is z. So this is just an ordinary differential equation. So all we need to do now is differentiate our temperature profile and multiply by our thermal conductivity to get the flux in the z direction. So let's see how that looks. So qz is equal to minus k times dt dz. If we were to differentiate this equation, we would get that that is minus 0.2z. So what does that look like? So that is the a very simple equation of a straight line, because k is constant, and also the 0.2 is a constant. So if we were to look at our flux in the z direction, that is going to be linearly increasing. And that is because our temperature profile is quadratic, so our flux profile is linearly increasing. And think about this in terms of driving force. Remember that the driving force for heat transfer in conduction is the temperature gradient. So heat is going to flow downhill. If you picture this graph as a hill, our heat is going to want to flow downhill from a higher energy state, represented by a higher temperature, to a lower energy state. And notice how the slope of this guy is changing. The slope is getting steeper and steeper in the negative direction as we go down, and that corresponds to our flux getting higher and higher as we go. This particular temperature profile is kind of just an arbitrary one just to teach this concept, but later on we're going to have really physically realistic temperature profiles that we will be able to derive by application of Fourier's law in a different manner than we're doing now. Okay, so that's our flux. Is It ends up being those negative signs cancel out, and we get that our flux is equal to 0 0.2 multiplied by k multiplied by z. So we're asked in this problem to evaluate our, our 
rate of heat transfer at a specific point. So let's first look at what our flux is at that point. So we'd plug in Z equals 2 meters here and plug in K is equal to 35. And so what we get is that at that particular instance, our flux is going to be 14.0 watts per meter squared. There are some funky unit things going on. This is an empirical equation, so any unit differences would be built into that constant there so that our temperature profile stays consistent in degrees C the entire time. And let's just make sure we did that right. So we have 0 0.2 times 35 times 2, which would give us 14. Yep. Okay, so we have our flux at that particular point at z equals 2 meters is 14 watts per meter squared. However, we are asked to get the total rate of heat transfer, which would have units of watts rather than watts per meter squared. So what do we need to do? We need to multiply our flux by the appropriate cross-sectional area. So heat is flowing this way through the cylinder, represented by our positive, having a positive heat flux the entire time. So we need to take that flux, so it's 14 watts per meter squared, we need to multiply that by the appropriate area, which is this cross-sectional area of a cylinder. So that cross-sectional area is going to be equal to pi times our radius squared. So to get the absolute rate of heat transfer in the z direction, that would be equal to our flux in the z direction times our area, which would be 14.0 watts per meter squared, and then our area is going to be pi times 0 0.1 meters quantity squared. If we go through and do the math, we end up with 0 0.44 watts. And remember that that is only true at a specific point equals 2 meters. Otherwise, we would need to um, plug in a different value for z and you'd see, because the cross-sectional area doesn't change, you'd see a plot that looks very similar to this if we were just plotting the total flow of heat as a function of distance. So one of the reminders for this problem, and just when you think about uh, solving problems and the dimensionality of those problems, it, you, students can sometimes tend to get confused. This is a one-dimensional problem, which means we're only considering variation of temperature and heat flux in one dimension. However, this a cylinder is very much a three-dimensional object. So it's, it's important to remember that even though we're only considering temperature variation in one dimension, we're still modeling a three-dimensional object. And so it's really important to think about this cross-sectional area and how heat is flowing um, through this three-dimensional object. So just something to remember. It can be very con convenient. Cylindrical coordinates can be really convenient because we can only consider one dimension that's quite convenient, and then we need to multiply that by the cross-sectional area to get total flow of heat.